Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm Paul Vratitak. I'm a partner at Pantera Capital. Pantera Capital is a, a fund, an institutional fund that has been investing into the blockchain space since 2013. Um, we do everything from equity to tokens to um, you know, pre-sales, active trading of, of cryptocurrencies on exchanges. And I'm really delighted to be here with you know, what I think are some of the best entrepreneurs and, and minds in the space. You know, I'll do a quick, do a quick introduction of, of each of them and then I'll, I'll let them talk a little bit about their project and what they're doing with, with blockchain. And then we'll get into some specific questions for, for each of them. And then, you know, of course, maybe uh, some other questions that kind of uh, go across everybody. But uh, Natalia, uh, uh, Cara Yanave. Uh, of well done. It's a difficult <laughs> surname. <laughs> it's, a, it's a difficult name. Um, and uh, she's the CEO of Propy and uh, everything related to a real estate on the blockchain. Um, you know, her background is serial entrepreneur. Uh, she also has been doing stuff in the, the real estate side too. And uh, really excited to have her. Uh, Josh Stein, uh, CEO of Harbor, uh, former general counsel of Zenefits, uh, also a lawyer, uh, Preston Byrne who has his own shop right now and is advising startup companies. And he used to be at Monax, which uh, means that I, I talked to him years ago around the- And I didn't the, invest. And I didn't invest. <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> but uh, Preston's been a, a very vocal person within the Twitter community. He has, has great opinions out there. And then uh, Paul, who I met today, uh, of Bitcomy, and uh, Paul Bao, from Singapore, serial entrepreneur, and he'll be providing some of the Asian perspective. But really, just kind of go down the line and you know, tell us, tell us about your project and, and really some of the stuff that you're doing, whether it's regarding tokens or, or blockchain stuff right now. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me today. Again, my name is Natalia. I'm the founder of Propy. In Propy, we utilize blockchain uh, to automate the home buying process. So we have built a settlement protocol uh, on smart contracts. And in 2017, we launched a token sale uh, with live product. And thus, this topic, uh, of course, uh, is a ver very interesting and uh, uh, important for us. Joshua Stein, co-founder and CEO of Harbor. Harbor is a security token issuance platform. The whole idea is to control the entire life cycle of those digital securities, particularly all the complex compliance rules about when they trade. Um, and as well, we've got a licensed broker dealer subsidiary and a licensed transfer agent subsidiary so that we can do the whole life cycle no matter what that digital security is. Uh, Preston, uh, I'm an attorney, I run my own law firm. Uh, people hire me because uh, I used to run a very early uh, blockchain tech company, which means that anyone who spins any BS, it gets very quickly caught. Um, so now as a consequence of doing that, I hate everything, and my clients pay me to yell at them uh, and explain why I hate what they're doing and how they can improve it. Hi, Paul uh, from Singapore. I'm Bitcherry uh, CEO and founder. Um, uh, our project is about the uh, e-commerce platform and based on blockchain, uh, considered as a uh, blockchain version of Amazon or Ali, Ali, uh, Alibaba, yeah. Awesome. Can I get a hands of how many, how many entrepreneurs in the room right now? All right, we got uh, maybe, maybe about 40, 50%. I mean, you know, I'll start off with one, one question, you know, um, just, just all across the board. I mean, you know, we've seen Telegram and how they, they they went out there and did their 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 token sale. We've seen Blockstack do it a, a bit differently with the Reggae Plus. Um, on on a high level right now, I mean, you know, how would you advise entrepreneurs in terms of you know what they should do in terms of launching launching a token right now, um, whether it's a utility token or a security token? Uh, how many people here are actually considering to launch a token sale, an ASTO or ICO? Zero, or maybe there are some, but uh, they're afraid to <laughs> admit that they're so brave to launch one. Um, so definitely 2017 was the year where everyone wanted to launch an ICO. Then the next year, everyone wanted to launch an, an STO. Um, so right now, the uh, everything that have has been happening with SEC and with Blockstack, Telegram, uh, Everything is providing us the lessons on how to treat uh, the whole test, uh, how to treat the guidelines. So it's it's uh, more clear on 
uh, how to launch it and whether to launch it. Uh, but I think uh, the attorney could uh, say a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, the problem is that, so what will happen is someone will get slapped on the wrist. So for example, EOS um, paid a fine that's equivalent to 60 basis points of what they claim they raised, 24 million off of allegedly 4 billion. Um, so people then come to you and say, hold on a second, if they can get away with that, why can't I get away with that? And I'm like, well, <laughs> because you didn't start your, your raise in 2017, and then you didn't hire Brian Klein as your lawyer to negotiate with the SEC before they had a bunch of settlements come out. So there is, I mean, with anything that you do in crypto, there's a sort of risk spectrum. There's no guarantee that you're going to get a lucky deal or something like that. There are ways that you structure around it. For example, you can go and do what Blockstack did. You can sell a security. Um, you can do it, I can't remember the other company, Fluffy Pony's investing in it. There's another company that just did an S1. So there are different ways you can structure these deals. And so doing the more regulated ways of structuring, I think, is preferred. So would you guys advise companies right now to go that route, to do the Blockstack route? I mean, you didn't do that route. You didn't, I mean, I, maybe in Asia it's completely different, right? There's actually... Uh, you know, more clarity and uh, less rules around. Oh, there's actually a differentiation between utility tokens and security tokens. Is is that is that how it is over there in Singapore? Uh, actually, ha I have no idea. Um, much idea of the how the U.S. ICO works, but in Asia and uh, in Singapore, it's the situation much better. Regulators know very strict, and uh, government is a very support is very supportive of the ICO and the cryptocurrency. Yeah, like mainly it's a utility token, but no security token, yeah. And have you actually worked with the government before you launched your utility token? Uh, no, okay. Um, as long as you a white paper, you must go to a lawyer. Lawyer have issued uh, legal opinions. The opinions will state uh, this is a, a utility token or security token. Once a lawyer says this, this, this one is a utility token, you just issue. It's no problem, yeah. So, I mean, in most jurisdictions outside of the U.S., not all of them, but most of them, it, they have very specific definitions on what a security is. And so all these utility tokens, these payment and governance mechanisms for, um, for dApps or Layer 1 protocols just don't fit in those definitions. Very few places, not just the U.S., but not a lot of places, have this sort of expansive catch-all, anything I don't like, I now call a security, right? Whether I call it the Howey test or whatever it is. So most, and you'll see that like with Blockstack. So Blockstack has was basically utility tokens, a payment mechanism um, for their dApp. Uh, they would love for it not to be a security. That's not gonna happen in the US. So they did what's called a reg S or sales to overseas folks. Yep. They're just selling it like a utility token, not treating yep. it like a security. And then they got a sale to US folks. And the reason they did a reg A is because you can sell to non-accredited investors. If you really are serious about having a DAP and not a, um, a casino, if you really want to drive usage, you need everybody to be able to buy small amounts, not just $10 million sales to whales. So um, what the Reg A allows them to do is get it out there broadly amongst a wider, more individual investor base in the U.S. Um, the real issue then is, is well, what can you do with it? How can you trade it? Um, do the securities rules apply for how long? Do you apply the, um, the hard and fast Hinman test where, uh, <laughs> where you figure out it transmogrifies and it's no longer a security? But fundamentally, what Blockstack does, um, what others is, they don't want to be a security. And that's very different than, you know, like what Harbor's involved in and, uh, and some other folks where you want to take what wants to be a security, a share in a company, a piece of uh, private um, credit, and you're just trying to make it digital and more liquid. Got it. So you guys would, you know, I, th I think at this point in time, like, it, it does seem like, you know, if you want to get your hands out in uh, your tokens out in the U.S. to as many people as possible and do it the safe route, it's doing a Reg A plus. Would would that be something that you guys would all sort of recommend right now? It, I so the answer is if you want to be compliant, yes. Yeah. Uh, if you want to be daring, daring and risk taking, and this is not legal advice or encouragement, but if you think you've got the investor demand, you want to do what Block One did, what EOS did. I mean, they raised four billion dollars. And their fine was twenty four million. Yeah, right. You <laughs> know what? Brian Klein. I mean, like, <laughs> I wouldn't have driven such hard a bargain. I would have been willing to pay fifty million on the four billion raise. The whew, tough crowd. The um, but it's just, I mean, that's a phenomenal <laughs> outcome. But 
you got to raise a lot. You're taking some risks. More importantly, you got to raise a lot of money. You have a big war chest to fight because you saw with some other small folks, they got shut down. They yeah. had to refund money to investors. They got killed, and their circumstances weren't that much different, but they just didn't have, they didn't have the money to fight. I mean, it depends. On, my advice, obviously, like as a practicing lawyer, is you, you tell people what the risks are. And if someone turned around and said to me, well, you know, I really want to go the EOS route, I said, cool, then I really don't want to represent you. <laughs> <laughs> so, because that's just not the kind of, it, that it, the, the long-term consequences that we're seeing with some projects is that they've been locked in negotiations with the SEC for years. And some will probably be locked in negotiations or litigation for longer, particularly those that actually have been sued. So what I would say is keep an open mind. And what I do say to entrepreneurs who approach me as they still do saying, listen, we know you're quite conservative about this. What do you think? Um, there are a lot of intermediate steps between having a full-blown public token raise and not being in business, right? So those include public permissioned networks that automate something or engage, create networks of some type that serve some valid business purpose. So I think a lot of people think it's quite binary, but in fact, there's a range of different things you can do between having a token and doing nothing at all. And I think what becomes really interesting is it's a timing issue. So Ethereum is sufficiently decentralized. E because it's out there, it's been used long enough, right? It's no longer dependent on the efforts of a small core group. And with um, EOS, what was really interesting is they got dinged for selling the ERC-20 token that had no real utility. It was just a placeholder for the later utility token. But they did not get dinged at all for the utility tokens because by the time, presumably reading into it, by the time the SEC came around, it was out there as being used in a non-security way. So what Blockstack and others hit is, is you can't be a security until enough people are using it, but you, how do you get people using it if you can't sell it in the first place? And so treating it like a security with a Reg A in the U.S. initially is a way to include the U.S. as part of your ICO or as part of the distribution of your token. But then Telegram case uh, educates us that actually if even you exclude U.S. investors, still SEC can come after you because then now they are looking at the liquidity in the secondary market. And if uh, there is a liquidity and uh, uh, tokens are uh, accessible to U.S. investors, then again you have a problem. There may be facts and circumstances there of which we're not aware. Um, so token, for example, uh, not token, pardon me, Telegram. Um, I'm if I may be recalling this incorrectly, but I seem to recall that they printed a large number of tokens for themselves, which would then be immediately tradable on exchanges. I have suspected that they were in discussions with U.S. exchanges. Um, I don't know this for a fact, but that would yeah. be my suspicion. So if that's the case, and you're looking at some, so all of a sudden all of these um, SAF notes would convert to the whales who'd bought in earlier, and then you were going to have a large number of tokens which would be in Telegram's hands, which wouldn't be restricted uh, and then would start trading on U.S. markets. That's a really different situation than with EOS, where potentially, I mean, uh, we, so that, that's a potentially yeah, different situation than with EOS, which I think technically the network was launched by people who weren't block one. I mean, it, it's kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudge, maybe, but that that's my understanding of how that worked procedurally. Um, so, and again, I could be wrong on both of those things, but that was my general impression. Um, and the other thing with Telegram, of course, is that they dodged a subpoena. Uh, which, of course, led to a lawsuit. They weren't having a conversation with the SEC. They were deliberately, it seems, deliberately avoiding having that conversation, which is why they sought the emergency order. Got it. Do you want to ask questions? Yes. Go for it. Hey, uh, so I'm Mike. I'm an investor. So I, uh, I feel like you're, I don't mean to zero in on you, but I'm going to. First of all, SCAD and ARPS represents Telegram, and they thought they did a pretty good job of buttoning it up and I guess with hindsight, you're saying they didn't, which is fine. But is the answer ever that the SEC is fucked up? Not that, you know, that there's always this perfectly awesome explanation as to why everybody did something wrong, but that maybe the SEC is the problem here? Or is that just something either you disagree with or you can't talk about because of your business? Um, I think one of the reasons I get invited to do these panels is because I don't practice before the commission. So I, I do have some freedom to speak about these issues. Um, to, Skadden Arps, um, despite what we have heard about that storied law firm, is made up of human beings. Uh, they are fallible, uh, unlike the Pope. So, so basically, that, that's the, to answer the first part of your question. And the second part of the question is I think there, there are many reasons why you could see inconsistent treatment between one scheme and the next. A lot of that, I suspect, comes down to the fact that the SEC didn't really set out its statement of policy 
until the 25th of July of 2017 when it published a report on the Dow, uh, which was a, a sort of decentralized hedge fund launched on Ethereum. So we're seeing one way to interpret, you know, read the tea leaves, is that projects that were launched before that date are getting treated in one way, and projects that are being launched after that date uh, are being treated a different way. We don't know because we can't see the internal deliberations of the commission on this. That's my own suspicion, uh, looking at the things that we've, the enforcement actions we've seen so far, but obviously we are unable to confirm that. So I think it's that there are different offices, uh, the negotiations played out in different ways. We're unable to really see behind the curtain because those all happen confidentially. Um, but yeah, there's not gonna be consistent treatment because of the facts and circumstances of each scheme. Yeah, but so, um, but the very fact that we have to resort behind to, well, there's probably facts out there we just don't know, is itself screwed up because then how are business people supposed to conduct themselves, right? You look at what's happening to Kick and you look at what's happening to Telegram, you think, oh, okay, I should follow the rules. And that's great. And there's a way to follow the rules and we can have debates about whether they should change or how to do it. And then you look at, say, block one and you're like, holy smokes, there's no way I should follow the rules. And by the way, they're a competitor or whatever they are. The problem is when you don't know what you're supposed to do, when you don't punish the guilty, you punish the innocent. When you don't give business people and consumers and investors clear guidance, then what you're doing is you're punishing the people who are trying to do things right, and you're rewarding the people who are doing things wrong. So I think like, I hear you, there probably are different facts, and I've been, I was a federal prosecutor for a while, I've been on that side of the table and I get it, but ultimately, this is a regulatory agency, and if they're going to regulate behavior, they have to have clear standards that are public for that behavior. I don't, I don't disagree. When I was in business for myself, I was competing against consensus, and I hated every second of it because they were running around printing one token after the next and had more resources than, than you could possibly count, and I was sitting there trying to raise $750,000 bridge rounds. So looking at, I feel your pain here, um, but I just don't think there's a straight answer, and I agree with Josh completely on this. It's unfair <coughs> that there is an inconsistent uh, playing field. I mean, do you think there is going to be some sort of you know, framework, or do you guys, you know, if there was a framework, like, could you imagine like what would be a good framework for this kind of stuff? It's starting to come out a little bit. There was a letter from the SEC and FINRA jointly on how broker dealers should, how they think about broker dealer licensure and ATSs and custody versus non-custody. Um, that was really that was that was pretty clear guidance, especially if you knew what to look for and they're following it and how they <coughs> deal with people. Um, so for a certain segment of the traditional financial community, it was very helpful. Um, but they have their own imperatives. They work from their point of view, and I've interacted with multiple folks from SEC and FINRA over the last couple of years. They feel like they're working at breakneck speed. They feel like they're out there publicly in ways that they normally aren't. And that is true for legacy financial world that moves at a glacial or geologic time frame. They are, but for an industry moving like ours. It's, it's too slow and it's not clear enough. And so that's the, that is a mismatch in terms of um, the needs and pace of the industry that's technology-based as opposed to legacy financial institutions. I still think we, we need to give a credit to SEC, even though, like, of course, entrepreneurs, crypto investors hate the involvement that we wish we didn't have a regulation in the decentralized uh, ecosystem. However, 2017, when we did our token sale, we had this fear that suddenly SSC can just uh, officially uh, determine all tokens to be securities, and they were such an official conversations. So now uh, every single lawsuit uh, is providing more guidance uh, on what to avoid. However, for an American uh, entrepreneur uh, in the crypto space, uh, it's too late. There are no entrepreneurs here who are willing to learn how to launch a, a token sale, whether it's STO or, or ICO. Um, but still, there is some progress, and uh, uh, definitely regulators now are paying a lot of attention to crypto, thanks to Facebook, Telegram, EOS. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll see more guidance. And, and I agree that um, actually some frameworks uh, are getting out, and the timeline is not that bad. Like two years to see uh, everything that is happening, and they uh, are producing... Uh, those investigations uh, and lawsuits every every week we have. Yeah, but it's a mismatch in time frames. Two years is very quick for a large bureaucratic agency to move 
given everything they've got to do. Two years is two lifetimes to a startup, particularly one absolutely. like a seed run yeah, round absolutely. of funding, right? Yeah. And so as that investor, like Paul is valuing the companies, is we are out in the space, um, what do you do? Am I, if I, am I being too cautious and in, in essence lighting my investors' money on fire and endangering my employees? Or am I being yeah, like too cheap. aggressive yeah. and endangering my company and my employees? I mean, it's just where you have too much ambiguity, it ill serves everyone and the time frame of modern capitalism is not a three to five year development of case law time frame. Absolutely agree with that. And we've, we've seen Kik uh, and other startups uh, which uh, had to invest too much money in lawsuits on, on attorneys and, and definitely they just had to, to pivot from developing a product to something else. We were in a, a very, uh, I don't know, like maybe because of uh, engaging with the right lawyers, uh, but f from 2017 we were very cautious on our marketing materials, press releases, to not promise any, any value in the future from the tokens. We the tokens with the network before uh, uh, the launch uh, of the of the product. We had an MOU with the government at that time, so we, we took all those precautious me uh, measures, and we actually were very careful uh, how to treat the, how we test. Uh, um, so I mean, this opportunistic uh, environment uh, of 2017. Uh, made some ICOs to use it and turn into scams, but some careful entrepreneurs still could innovate and, and make development. I mean, if we were not to raise $50 million back then, uh, we were not really very much VC fundable because we're uh, building a settlement protocol for real estate, which is impossible to make like with half a million dollars. And within uh, 28 months of development, now we're seeing this interest from enterprises, real estate developers. So without this support from uh, thousands of uh, token holders, uh, this innovation wouldn't be uh, happening. Well, well, Paul, you're, you're based in Singapore. I mean, would you, and, and maybe some others, would you suggest just excluding U.S. investors and just taking international investors, setting up outside, foundation, that sort of thing? Uh, okay. Actually, for Singapore-wise, um, what did I say? Okay. For, uh, take my project example. Actually, we don't involve the, any U.S. Uh, investors. Yeah. Because uh, I know the SEC is, is very, very, you know, fierce. Yeah. <laughs> okay, even in Singapore, right, normally we don't sell our token to Singapore citizen. The same thing, the Singapore government also very fierce. If you use the sales token to, I mean, uh, you know, ICO always have a risk. Yeah. We mm -hmm. also cannot promise the price, that they say, uh, 100 times or 200 times. Yeah. But normally we say we issue our coins in Singapore. We will sell our coin outside of Z Singapore, like China, like yeah. Malaysia, or Thailand, or Vietnam. Yeah, it's a good market. Yeah, it's, it's good Got enough it. for you to raise the fund. Yeah. And Paul, how about you? Yeah. Are you trying to focus on STOs or ICOs? And when you invest in utility tokens, are you trying to go after companies like BitCherry, which is outside of the US? Or um, how do you deal with those tokens uh, and uh, uh, combine with the equity investment? Yeah, you know, I was just about to get into STOs and give a little bit of, of feedback myself. I mean, we, we will look at everything. You know, I think for us, uh, all the things that you guys have mentioned, uh, I think, are, are right. I mean, we look for entrepreneurs that, you know, want to do things uh, the right way. But at the end of the day, you know, we're going to, we're going to balance the risk. You know, we're going to see, like, hey, uh, what are they trying to do? What do we think about the token itself? Um, who are their users, and what's best for the company based off of like all the different uh, trade-offs that they're going to look at. But you know, we're we're sort of open to everything. You know, we've we've invested all the way since 2017, and a lot of those were what we think are, are utility tokens. And then, you know, as we move along, some of these utility tokens are turning into you know Reg A plus tokens. And then, um, more recently, I, I'm starting to see some of our portfolio companies. 
who are planning to do utility tokens now say, actually, we're going to do a Reg A+, plus, but we're going to do it um, really like a, a security token and only get listed on an open finance, a T0. And we're, you know, the, the CEO said, I do not want any chance of going to jail. So I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to do whatever I can to be by the book. And I don't know. I mean, it, uh, you know, I we'll, we'll take a look at that, too. I think the, the concern for us would be as a fund. Uh, the way that we're structured when we invest into token deals, um, you know, we need a certain level of liquidity because it's a hedge fund. So, you know, is there going to be enough liquidity? Is there going to be enough demand in general? And, and as they should be utility tokens. Yeah, exactly. And right now, like the trend is for utility tokens for, for those two factors. So that becomes a little bit of, uh, you know, gray area for us and how we're going to deal with that. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, do you, do you guys think that security tokens are going to be, you know, a great avenue? And I, I know, of course, Harbor started off in that path too. And uh, you guys have probably looked at it from just uh, an, as an entrepreneur, as an advisor. Yeah. So I think um, I would divide security tokens into sort of two different worlds. One is traditional securities getting digitized to make them more liquid. And I think Reg A's are a great one for that. Right. It's a way to you can sell directly to non-accredited. You can start selling. You can sell in small share amounts, ten dollars a share. And, and you can Reg A became available with the just, Jobs jo Act just now. I mean, for tokenized, yeah, just yeah, recently, because Block uh, two thousand seventeen, it was not possible. But it's um, it's just it is. But there's traditional securities, right? So it's a share in the company. It's a bond. It's a debenture that's paying an interest rate. It's something everyone recognizes as security. That's one group, tokenizing it can help aid with liquidity, particularly with the Reg A, where you're never gonna list in a national exchange. And then you can list in places like an open finance. And I think that's really exciting. Um, we've got one uh, coming tentatively in quarter one, 2020, real estate fund, um, and others kind of in the pipeline that we're looking at that we're excited about. I think um, the other bucket though, are things that are legally getting treated as security, but that the, the neither the investor nor the issuer the company wants to be a security, right? Like Blockstack, they did a Reg A plus in order not to get shut down, but they don't want the Blockstack token to get treated as a security. They want it treated as a protocol token, not subject to regulation, so it can be used out there to power their ecosystem, right? Same thing with Kick and Kin. Um, and so that's a real dividing line. I think what's Blockstack Pioneer is kind of interesting because if you step back, the issues around the, sec the securities laws were designed to protect investors. And what Blockstack did with their Reg A kind of is trying to combine the best of both worlds. Hey, the initial sale, we're going to make sure that we follow the proper disclosures with a Reg A. You got published financials, risk factors. And they did a great job with the prospectus. Um, but then that what they're trying to say is, and they're not sure that this is going to happen later, is hopefully after a little bit, this will no longer get treated as a security. And then we can just let this thing move around freely the way it was originally intended. And if in fact that's allowed to happen, then that's great. You, pr you protect investors when they're first giving money to the entrepreneur to build something, which is classic capital raising fund. It's uh, what the securities laws were classically designed to protect people about. And then once it's out there and it's actually fu a functioning software system, then you're no those protections are no longer really applicable. I mean, this is a debate we've been having for years and I am hopeful that Blockstack and YouNow's Reg A process becomes a way for folks to do that. Well, one thing I really like about the Reg A is that it has a cap of $50 million, which is interesting because some of the ICOs we've seen, and I'm not going to name names, um, but a pre-product, pre-revenue company raising a billion dollars is insane. No, like, that should never happen. But what the Reg A does, remember, there's both the token and the issuer of the token. At some point, a company like Blockstack is going to have to cross the chasm and go from a company that was building an open source protocol that it can't monetize to a company that has cash flows that it can, you know, that, that it can use and then build value for its shareholders. And that's an interesting question how you can do that. So I think any company that really, you know, that deserves to exist can do that with $50 million, which is the cap of Reg A. Um, and I think that that will wind up actually benefiting investors in the long run, having that sort of cap. Whether the U.S. decides in the long term, you know what, maybe we should raise that cap on the Reg A to 100 million, 200 million, so these companies can raise more money with subsequent token offerings or token listings is another question.
But I still believe that pure utility tokens should exist and, and should be launched, especially when we're talking about public blockchains uh, or even permissioned blockchains. And we see some examples that didn't have lawsuits like um, uh, Hashgraph Hedera, uh, they had a token sale, uh, recently they distributed tokens. So once the public blockchain is launched and there is a, an immediate utility, then I don't think that the risk of the race is large. But I would also agree with Preston that if you raise a relatively small amount of funds, then SSC probably wouldn't go after you. And now we're having a thing like Telegram. So Paragon, Paragon and Airfox didn't raise much. But they, then you, they, you look at their marketing materials and it's, it's a pure promise of future profits. Right. You, if I, you avoid those... I, I hear you, but that's why people hand over their money. They don't hand over their money not to make a profit, right? So, I mean, that's I think the issue is, is early on, people are selling tokens to raise capital. Investor protections of some kind ought to apply at that point. But then the question is, now you want this software to actually function. You can't have it continue to apply to that thing that you that electronic thing that you put out in circulation. And I do think the SEC is genuinely grappling with that, and I do think we're starting to see movements. You're starting to see broker dealers and transfer agents get licensed in this space. Um, you're starting to see the reg A's get a, you're starting to see reg A's get approved. So there's a way to do it. Um, but I just think slapping the word utility token on it and saying, well, I'm okay because I only raise a small amount, or I just don't to Preston's point is facts and circumstances for each one, but I do think you have to be careful, and I don't think that the pass that someone like a block one got is going to happen again, particularly if you don't raise an enormous sum to be able to fight. Yeah, we're coming to the end of the panel. I mean, last question, you know, what do you, what do you think is going to happen to the future of utility tokens in the next, you know, three to four years? Any predictions on, you know, if, if we're all, you know, they're all going to go to reggae or, or I don't know, any, any any thoughts on like what people should sort of maybe expect going forward? For utility tokens? Utility tokens. Not STOs. Yes, just utility tokens. Yeah. Um, well, as far as I'm seeing, uh, observing where crypto funds are investing right now, they're primarily blockchain, uh, first layer or second layer. There are no investments in utility tokens uh, uh, in application and thus, I will see uh, the death of both ut uh, utility tokens in the blockchain uh, layers, uh, the first one and the second one, because of the lack of applications. Uh, I don't see um, funds and investors, uh, accredited investors, to pay enough attention to applications. Uh, and the retail investor today is not participating in the ICO space. So the only hope we have for ICOs here in the US uh, is institutional investor to actually pay attention both to uh, the apps and blockchains. Uh, and obviously uh, other countries probably will start uh, leading uh, the game for the utility tokens. I don't know. I mean, I think ultimately it just depends on do you actually get adoption and usage of the dApps and the layer one protocols. Um, that's the first question, because if you don't get adoption, then all you have is a fancy electronic roulette wheel. Um, if you, uh, there's nothing wrong with betting it all in red, um, the, uh, or the hard six if you're on the craps table. The, um, but even then, then if that happens, then do the token economics actually work out the way we, we've all kind of architected, or do they not? And that gets really kind of interesting. Um, you're starting to see the adoption in the DeFi space, but you haven't really seen it anywhere else yet, but hopefully, Hopefully it's coming um, on the protocol token side. And then on the security token side, you've got folks like Harbor and others in the space. And I think you're you're starting to see adoption. I think it's going to continue to be slow for a while. But then what, once you hit a critical mass and you can actually deliver liquidity to investors at the point at which they need it, then they demand it. And then you've got a flywheel going and then adoption really takes off. Yeah, in the US, you're going to see a lot of uh, reggae, or if you don't see it in the reggae, you're going to see a private placement plus an overseas offering, which doesn't then seek to be listed on US exchanges. Um, I think that's the that's sort of the, the word of the day for you know, legal structuring. Uh, in terms of adoption, I think there still needs to be the installation phase for a lot of the tooling still isn't there. We still don't have a lot of websites that have native Bitcoin functionality. 
Um, you know, or if they do, they're using traditional payment rails like BitPay or Coinbase instead of something like BTC Pay Server or Lightning. So I think there's got to be a lot more tooling installed and a lot more websites that offer services for the basic stuff, which would translate a lot better once you have token networks that also do other things. Um, so, so yeah, it, it'll just take a little time. Yeah, I believe more people will invest uh, in the token in the future because in door one night, uh, a lot of scam project is that off. Uh, and some more the investor getting smarter. They know which one is a scam pro project, which one is a good project. So only the good project will left and more people invest on it. Yeah. Yeah. Lastly, I mean, for us, we, we've invested both on layer one, layer two scalability and also at the application level. Um, yeah, from what we've seen, the guys developing applications, it just takes a lot longer, and part of it's because they're developing some of the tooling needed to remove the friction for users to actually come on board. It takes seven steps to actually get into a decentralized uh, application like InstaDapp. So, you know, companies themselves are doing it themselves, are also working with other companies that we're funding to remove that friction. And, you know, once that happens, in addition to, you know, some of the scalability stuff and fiat on ramps, then, you know, hopefully we'll see all of it kind of come together um, and, and some of these use cases around just intermediating um, you know, these large companies and enabling new use cases will actually come to fruition. Well, I think that's it. I mean, thank you so much. You know, hopefully you guys learned a bit about regulations and different types of, uh, different types of offerings. And you know, if you guys want to talk more to these guys, I'm sure they'll be around the conference later on. Thanks. Thanks.